Hello, everyone. Hello. Very honored to be introducing our guest speaker for today. Uh, about four years ago, we entered into a very strategic OEM partnership with Cerner. And Mr. Peter Smart uh, leads the team of geniuses that have developed what you're going to see today. And so without further ado, Peter Smart. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I'm not sure how to follow that. That was a very nice introduction. Um, I do recognize that I'm uh, what stands between you and potentially happy hour, a good drink, good food. Uh, so I admire the dedication. I appreciate everybody um, coming here today. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Tableau and Cerner's partnership, a little bit about Cerner and what we're doing. And then I've got four different use cases or client stories to share with some of the good work, some, some true quantitative, tangible uh, type examples uh, using both healthy intent and, of course, Tableau as a part of that. So most of you know Cerner um, as an EMR, EHR company. We have roughly 25% of the domestic um, EHR market. Uh, as, as my counterpart, Brian Burnham, uh, also from Cerner, made note this morning or earlier this afternoon, um, a good way to think about it is you, you yourself or someone you know most likely has been to either a hospital um, or a clinic that has Cerner as a part of it. Um, we're up to 28,000 associates. Uh, when I started way back in the aughts, I think our group was uh, 4,000 associates, so seven times growth in terms of um, number of people we get to work with. Uh, $5 billion revenue um, year over year for about the last three or four years. And then the, the big middle one, uh, we spent a lot on R&D. So getting into a little bit about uh, what we're doing with Tableau, um, as Dan mentioned, that mouse doesn't work. Um, as Dan mentioned, um, in 2014, thank you, uh, we, Cerner went out to market for RFP for visualization tools. Um, we had many of Tableau's competitors click um, SAP, um, Oracle, and obviously Tableau. We ended up uh, selecting Tableau to be a part of our big data uh, population health platform. Um, we've seen that partnership grow. Um, technically, we were an OEM partner. I've heard that term is now passe. Um, it's grown beyond that where now we have Tableau installs on our corporate side. So on the corporate side, we have roughly 14,000 named users across two different sites. Uh, I think there's around half, about 500 that are, that are truly doing um, publisher type work. But virtually what that means is that um, more than half of everyone at Cerner touches Tableau in some way, mostly for viewing, but, but we're using it uh, pretty broadly on the corporate side. On the population uh, health side, uh, we have now created 100 different customer sites, so that's 180 um, unique customers within our population health um, platform, um, equates to roughly 185,000 named, uh, excuse me, not named, licensed users, um, 600 scheduled tasks, and 158 gigabytes, and if, if you're kind of a database or or space kind of guy, 158 gigabytes doesn't seem like a lot. We do a lot of our um, work on live connections. We use HPE Vertica on the back end. Um, today, there's one main um, data center for our uh, population health um, product. Uh, we do have other domains, so UK, um, federal is coming down the pike. We've got some uh, people in here working with, with them. And then we also have a, an AWS instance uh, as a part of our state of Montana contract. We've got other things coming up um, globally in the EU as well as in the uh, South Pacific. So 
just to get an idea of how much we've grown on the population health side, um, again, 180 um, tenants that we have. Um, this is coming from second quarter of 2014, where we started out with one, uh, and that's grown to the 180 as of Q2 um, 2018. That's across 41 different United States states. Um, that's awkward. Uh, two, two countries, and we're, we will be growing into um, Sweden in 2019, so we'll be up to three countries. Just a quick note on our engagement with Tableau. Um, in addition to being an OEM partner, um, we do participate in, in the elite support program. Um, we work very um, hand in hand with Tableau on site specific SAML, um, SAML being an authentication mechanism that we use as a part of our platform. Um, what this did was allow us to segregate the security uh, and, and really allow our clients to start to be able to use Tableau Desktop as a part of the, the infrastructure. So that was very important to us. Um, that came about about a year ago. Uh, we've collaborated a lot on automation in terms of, um, in terms of installs and content um, development, and then we've, we work pretty broadly on security. So, What's the challenge? And I should, have, I should have stated early on that this is going to be pretty population health um, focused. So if you don't care about pop health, you know, you can go get your drink early. I'm fine with that. Um, so pressures abound, especially if we look at the macro level. Um, you start with aging population. I think a lot of us understand that um, 1,000 people graduate um, into Medicare every single day. Um, in, I think by 2025, we're gonna be at roughly 85 million um, people in Medicare alone. That's a huge number. Consolidation. Uh, 2017, M&A um, in the health system space was up 13%. In Q1 of this year, it was up an, 11, an additional 11%. So everywhere you look, you're seeing mergers and acquisitions. Um, you're seeing rural hospitals get bought up or, or shut down, frankly. Uh, and you're seeing some of the big dogs um, consolidate as well. So in 2018, three of those deals were of health systems with revenue of a billion dollars or more. Regulatory, BPCI, APM, MSSP, uh, what am I forgetting here, MACRA, HRQ, HEDIS, ABC, 123, Jackson 5. There's, there's a lot going on in the regulatory space. There's a lot of um, regs that come out every single year that are, that are brand new. Uh, CMS likes to change things up every year on every single program as well. So there's a lot of administrative overhead um, that, that is necessary to ensure that the learning curve isn't punted down to our providers who frankly really don't care um, that, you know, HEDIS measure number 96 in 2018 started excluding, excluding a, a particular diagnosis. Um, social determinants of health. So this is, there's been research, you know, for a while now, probably 20, 25 years, um, that has really started to hone in on um, social determinants are probably more so the cause than reactive um, type healthcare. Um, in 2014, Harvard released a report that's, or, or a, uh, a research review that stated that um, zip code was a better predictor than genetic code. Um, education has been um, linked to, to better, better healthcare. These are things that we kind of generally know, uh, but at the end of the day, it's they're important items that, um, that affect how we provide care um, and how we're getting it. New competition, so I'm, I'm sure a lot of um, people, you know, followed the Amazon, Berkshire, um, JP Morgan, that was just one instance. Um, although, I don't, does anybody really know what they're gonna do? I'm not sure I do. Um, 
You look at Uber, Uber's starting Uber Health, you look at CVS and Aetna, you look at Walgreens and Cigna. Um, lots of different um, new entrants into, into the market. And then reimbursement models. So CMS stated by 2020 uh, that you know 100% of their models will be value-based care. Uh, that, of course, has subsided over the last two or three years with the new administration. But um, by and large, they continue to move into that um, in that way. So I actually don't like this graphic. I'm not sure why I'm using it, um, but perhaps that is the point of this. Um, so, so thinking of it another way from an administrative and a provider system um, perspective, these are these are all the things that our providers have to think about. Um, so you move from infrastructure. What does the technology look like? How are we organized? Um, you move to business model shift. Provider reimbursement is changing. Um, you need to think about performance improvement activities, care management, clinical integration. So there's, there's a lot going on um, with our provider systems. And then lastly, on, on sort of the, the macro challenges, how many people have seen this slide? before, or this graphic. I use it a lot. Um, frankly, so this is Commonwealth Fund. Uh, I believe this came out in 2012. Um, they cherry picked a little bit, but, but what this is representing is 11 of the, of the 30, <clears throat> 30 or so OECD um, nations. And the reason I like it is it depicts pretty clearly two things. If you look at the bottom row, 8,508 uh, annualized per capita for the United States. If you look at all the other countries, the, the, the next biggest is 5,700, and most of them are in the 3,000 to 4,000 range. So clearly, we spend a lot of money on, on, um, on health. Um, in addition to that, you know, we rank last, at least on this cherry-picked list. Uh, in, tr in terms of overall ranking, we're last in cost, we're last in efficiency, we're last in e equity, we're ultimately last in healthy lives. So we're not really getting a whole lot um, bang for our buck. So one organization that is trying to change this, at least as it pertains to their local environment, is uh, University of Alabama, Birmingham. Um, which is in Birmingham, Alabama, how about that? Um, so in terms of a business reason, Alabama ranks as one of the lowest in overall health. Uh, 2017, US News, US World and News Report ranked them 47th out of 50. Um, that was a stupid thing to say. I think we know that there's 50 states. Um, Adult obesity is 34% versus the national 29% um, rate. Physical inactivity is roughly 5 to 10% higher. Deaths per, per thousand by chronic condition, all higher. Um, Alabama as a state has a, you know, you talk about social determinants, they've got lower, um, perhaps lower education, lower socioeconomic um, barriers, or, or higher barriers, I should say. So in 2016, I mean, clearly UAB and, and most health systems have had care management programs. Um, what they did with us is they went with our care management solution um, and implemented that in, uh, they went live in 2018. So the beginning, uh, Q2 of 2018. Uh, and really with our, with our solution, what we're trying to do is identify those best candidates uh, to put into that care management program and then providing applications that support the oper operationalization um, of, of care management. Um, on the analytics side, what we're really trying to do is, is, you know, A, identify those best candidates for the programs, and then B, understand the, the efficacy from both a total cost of care perspective as well from a, from a utilization perspective. So what are our targets? Uh, they're pretty cut and dry, right? Um, lower PMPM, PM, ED per, per 1,000, uh, inpatients per 1,000, all lower readmissions. That's really what we're trying to, what we're trying to do here. 
Uh, second visual, so truly understanding that utilization. Um, you know, we're, we're creating visuals that we can filter by payer plan, um, pretty standard stuff, um, care management, case type, closure reason, and then plotting X minus zero and zero minus X. So figuring out what the start day is for each case, um, being able to plot it across, um, so we can understand the utilization, um, not necessarily on a temporal basis, but, but normalize the time across. So again, our targets are the same. Um, so er early indications, and UAB actually presented on this at our, at our health conference, um, they had $43 PMPM savings between like cohorts, and that's across all of their, um, all of their different programs. From a diabetic perspective, they had roughly $600 difference PMPM. So these are like real numbers. Now $43 for one person doesn't seem like that much. $43 times 12 times 2,000, um, the numbers start to add up and you find real value there. So from an analytic pressures abound, um, you know, this is probably the world that most of us live in. Uh, we feel these pains every day. Um, you talk about skill, so, skill set shortage, although, you know, given that we have 30 or 40,000 people here, maybe, maybe I'm under a rock or something. Um, but it's hard, to find, it's hard to find good people, especially in our industry, it's hard to find good people that understand um, healthcare and healthcare data. Um, competing priorities as technology gets, gets better and more advanced as the tableaus of the world you know, improve and enhance on top of their roadmap. Um, as we centralize analytics and organizations, uh, we start to see lots of competing priorities. Um, and then doubling down on that, it becomes really difficult to understand what ROI is. Uh, if you can't understand ROI, it becomes really difficult to prioritize um, your work. Dirty da data, that's a tradition like none other in healthcare. Um, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I think we all get that. Uh, and then disparate data sources. So, you know, as a part of dirty data, looking at claims data, looking at EMR, looking at scheduling, looking at admin, rev cycle, GL, um, Given that a lot of it is dirty, it, it becomes pretty cumbersome, especially across multiple sources. Most of, most of the organizations um, we work with, you know, I, don't, I think zero of them are all Cerner, um, except maybe some of the communities. Um, they're, they have multiple EMRs. Um, if they're in more than one value-based contract, they're gonna get multiple payer um, claims. So it's, it's, it, it becomes really difficult. Um, and creates a lot of pressure on our analytics groups. Um, data governance is a good thing. It's been around for a while. It's really starting to pick up steam, at least as far as I'm concerned. Um, that's, that's good. You know, you, you had the situation where you, you produced one report from two different organizations. Uh, the numbers come out different um, because of definition issues. Um, data governance helps to solve some of that. Um, the flip is that because it is probably in its toddler phase at a lot of our organizations, uh, you know, figuring out how to make it work creates added time to make decisions on, on the type of analytics you wanna be providing. So there's, there's sort of a, um, a disparate or, or um, two competing forces there. And then lastly, adequate tool sets, um, those actually, are starting to improve um, substantially. Uh, we see that here at Tableau, of course. So from a Tableau and healthcare analytics perspective, really I go down to the, the four bullets here. Self-service with appropriate data control, I think that's actually really important to, to state. Um, the self-service is nice. If you have no control over, over what's being produced, um, you can really screw yourself. Um, significantly reduce central analytics investment. So I would actually probably, I probably should have flipped that. Um, you don't necessarily need to significantly reduce your investment. 
what it actually does is al allow you to free up resources to do more of the true analysis, um, hit more of the areas, uh, you know, instead of having to focus on one, one maybe two narrow sets. Uh, this discovery is increased at the edge, again, in a controlled environment. And then lastly, um, Tableau, easy to, it's easy to articulate improvement and opportunity um, with the tool sets that are provided. So from an analytics perspective, um, what we're striving for, make it meaningful. So appropriate level in the appropriate way. And then the second bullet for that is probably the more important one, make it actionable. Um, you know, everybody loves pretty pictures. We actually, when we do road shows or the dog and pony as it were, um, you always gotta have a map in there and nobody can really articulate what good the map's gonna do, but it's pretty. Uh, and maps can be good, um, I'm not saying that. Um, but ensure that it's, that it's actually actionable. Uh, make it relevant. So this is something we've act, frankly struggled with um, and we're really coming to grips with probably over the last year or so, but include only the most relevant information for the top level executives. Um, give the analysts all the detail. Um, ensuring that you have that dichotomy is important. Doing user stories is important. Understanding your audience and your consumers is important. And then give as much context as possible while, while staying coherent. Also important, extremely hard. So we, we were in situations where we, um, we get you know, I wanna know every definition of everything under the sun um, as it pertains to this particular visual. Um, that's fine for some people and you need to have all of that documented. You, you also need to have a coherent and simplified message for especially for your, a lot of your um, higher level executive types. And then lastly, make data accessible. Um, we talked about messy data. Um, using Tableau makes it easy to organize. And then caveat, 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 caveat. So we work with a lot of um, actuaries and accountants. Uh, it becomes a struggle to, to state that it's not gonna be to the penny um, or and why it's not gonna be to the penny. Which leads me to do not let perfect be the enemy of good. Um, I love this. A lot of the things, especially in population health, we do. Um, they have to be directional, right? CMS isn't giving, I mean, they're not giving you every single um, claim on, they're not giving you any claims on opt-out patients. Um, we see that with payers. We get payers that, that blind, um, blind their out-of-network dollars. So remember that you know, directional is better than, than nothing. Um, incidentally, I was about to attribute this to this, a CIO we work with and our um, Viz lead mentioned that, you know, she wasn't the first person to say this. <laughs> so, thank you, Jeff. Um, so from a healthy intent perspective, we're at 180 clients now. Um, and really just wanted to show this to, to highlight that we're not just working with health systems. Um, Clearly that's you know, uh, our tradition and our bread and butter, um, the provider systems. Um, but we're also working with community hospitals, with um, accountable care organizations, um, either standalone or as a part of, a part of provider, provider systems. And then lastly, this other bucket continues to grow. So between DODVA, um, we also have a fairly substantial employer-based um, service keep reaching down to with the so so healthy intent what are we really trying to do when, when healthy intent started in 2012 we um, we as a company were really focused on chronic condition management wellness program management as well as care management and really the goal is to create a singular longitudinal record across multiple disparate um, data sources you know, these are typically 
EMR type um, data sources, but you throw in claims, enrollment, scheduling, et cetera. We want every single data point that might be relevant about a person and, and seamlessly um, pull those all together. So with all of that, you know, we're looking to aggregate and normalize where we have um, source agnostic data models. So there's one condition model, there's one procedure model, there's one claim model. Um, on top of that, we're creating and applying, applying intelligence. So running multiple data science created type algorithms, whether they be ours um, or, or industry standards, opening up um, the data so that we, we allow open development outside of Cerner to happen, and then ultimately act and measure. So run through data through the pipe one time um, and, and allow its use for multiple solutions. So I talked a little bit about registries or, or our wellness and chronic condition management, um, point of care solution, um, care management, analytics, obviously, EDW. So all of these things meant to run, a, run on top of the big data platform. We are using you know, the, the potpourri of, of big data technologies, Hadoop, um, partnership with Cloudera, HBase, Solar, um, and then Tableau, Vertica, and Business Objects is really the, the space we, we get to play in. So just quickly to highlight, um, we've seen 650 different sources. So I'm trying to see when this, I think we're above that now. Um, 65 different claims um, sources, 35 different EHRs. Um, we're bringing in open data and then retail pharmacy lab, et cetera. So I'll let you get the picture. So one of, our, um, one of our clients, Memorial Herman, um, four years ago, they wanted to understand um, what, their net, what their network leakage looked like. Who's going in? Who's going out? Um, why are they doing it? Business reason. Uh, Greater Houston Metro is highly competitive. I don't know if anybody here has been to besides the Houston guys, I'm sure, in the room, but um, has it ever been to Medical City um, near Rice Village in Houston, but you walk down the street and you walk past Houston Methodist, MD Anderson, uh, Memorial Hermann, and HCA, all within about a three block radius. Um, very competitive. Uh, Memorial Hermann also has a lot of at-risk contracts. I'm gonna butcher the number, but I think they're up to seven or 800,000 um, at-risk lives. So this is really important to Memorial Hermann. They, they wanted to get a glimpse of um, an understanding of, of who is going in, who is going out. And I, the other key here is for controllable services. So they didn't really care about their dialysis, um, people, people going out a network for dialysis because they don't really have a lot of outpatient dialysis centers. So understanding in the context of controllability um, was important for Memorial Hermann. So again, who is sending members out of network? Why are they doing it? What plans does it affect um, from a payer plan perspective? Um, is it controllable? So the target is pretty clearly out, to, out changes to in. Uh, so the punchline here, over two years, um, 2016 to the end of 2017, they moved the meter. Um, 3% doesn't sound that great from an at-risk perspective, that translates to $40 million, and probably bigger um, for those, for those in-network, not at-risk um, patients. So big number, good story. The Vice President of Strategic Analytics at Memorial Hermann, we trust this data. We now have insight that the payers do not have. We never really knew how we were performing, and with healthy intent, we can. And that's in large part to the exposure of the data using Tableau. Another example we have here is, is on the, more on the clinical side. So 
Adventist Health out in Roseville, California, um, created about four years ago, quantitative imperatives focusing on um, being the highest quality provider in the West. So the, the first four and what we see on the left um, that they focused on was safety, um, so looking at hospital acquired conditions, uh, readmissions, patient satisfaction, and mortality. So all good things to care about. Um, after doing a, a baseline, they figured out organizational goals, uh, and those are a part of this. They're using stoplights and trending, and, and this left is actually their landing page. So if you see this little um, guy towards the middle, um, all of those actually link out to detailed reports specific to um, that particular area. One such area is acute length of stay observed to expected. Um, so they're showing trend year over year on the bottom. Uh, at the top, they're looking at facility by facility who's trending backwards or forwards, um, 2018 to 2017. And then on the right side, we see, um, we see bundled, giving detail by bundled conditions. Is that colorblind? Is that colorblind? It's green, red is color, the colorblind, right? Okay, apologies. Not that I built this, but <laughs> I'll apologize for them. Um, so in terms of success, they had a lot of success in 2017 across their program. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do in 2018. And then lastly, um, just to highlight their, their stoplight report. So using stoplights so that executives at Adventist Health can quickly show statuses or quickly understand what the statuses are um, at a system level, at a region level, at a network level, and then ultimately at the, at the site level. So target being the blue dot. Lastly, from a healthy intent perspective, um, in addition to normalizing data, um, aggregating it up, we're providing and embedding um, out of the box um, type value as well. As a part of our strategy to, um, to bring data on the platform, we're not only bringing uh, a provider system's data, we're, we're also bringing publicly available data. So we're trying to go out and find anything that may or may not, no, not may not, may be relevant to um, healthcare and how you're doing analytics within your healthcare and put it out on the, on the platform um, for, your, for your use to your heart's desire. Um, in addition, we, are, we have embedded um, algorithms that are you know, more so thought as industry standards. So 3M's potentially preventable. Um, Sweet, they're, they've been adopted by a lot of Medicaid programs. Um, we're, we're also doing 3M diagnosis groupers and episodic groupers. Um, Truven for service line categorization. Um, New York University uh, doing avoidable ED visits as a part of that. Milliman Mara and then health partners. In addition to that, we also embed, of course, our um, Cerner created algorithms, most notably um, HCCs, transitions of care, and uh, readmission. So last story for the day. Um, in terms of client stories. Um, Cox Health in Springfield, Missouri, um, pretty low overall health in that, in that community and around it. Um, they were seeing an average RAF score, so risk adjustment factor, uh, mostly for use for MA and MSSP. Um, they were seeing a lower than average RAF in a less than healthy community. Uh, so what they went out and did um, they took some of our analytics here that we see on the top, uh, use it to identify actionable opportunity, and created, created an ROI statement. So you see on the bottom right, um, they haven't realized it yet, but they have recognized that they have roughly $50 million to $80 million over a five-year period in terms of opportunity. As a part of the analytics, what we're trying to do here, this is probably a good example of how we're trying to make it actionable. 
Um, so not only are we giving um, opportunity by attributed PCPs and patient or, or member demographic information as well as appointment data, um, we're also categorizing all of these people into various buckets on how you should treat them. So outreach for future, um, chart review, pending claims administration, um, outreach for future because we have no evidence that we've ever seen you, um, things like that. So really trying to make it actionable and of course be able to slice by plan, payer, and that type of action. So, <laughs> um, I did do this one, which I probably shouldn't have. <laughs> like, it's like a, I don't know, an anti-Jackson Pollock. Um, so, what, you know, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to, we're trying to lower the cost curve. We're trying to increase revenue. Um, and, and above all, we're trying to increase quality. So across these four stories that we've talked about, we've got Memorial Hermann with their $40 million in network. Um, we have a 54 million potential HCC opportunity. And then UAB is $53 PM PM. Um, per. From a quality perspective, UAB specifically, we've already seen uh, a drop by over 50% in acute utilization um, across like cohorts for their care management program, um, in improved org metrics, that was at Venice Health, and generally speaking, uh, more consistent care. So what's next for Cerner? Um, this is what today looks like at a, at a 50,000 foot level. We have healthy EDW, which is combining tools as well as the content on top of healthy intent. Um, cost and utilization is probably our uh, biggest content um, package, understanding cost and utilization. Um, cost, cost accounting is new. HEDIS, HEDIS ACO, one thing I didn't talk about here today, but we do, um, we do a lot of measure outcome creation, so, so you don't have to, as a provider system, understand um, analytically all of the different inclusion, exclusion, met, not met criteria. Um, MIPS we have on the platform, and then Healthy Data Lab is our uh, solution, newer, newer offering uh, for data scientists. And then lots of content, and so what does it look like uh, in 2019, what are the things that we're tackling? Um, the green's functional, the blue is content. So a lot of the blue we've actually done already in parts and pieces, and it's really just about shoring up. So everybody cares about BPCIA. Not everybody, but a lot of people care about BPCIA. Um, workforce health, departmental, a lot of this is gonna be around the population health side, but um, clearly there's interest in being able to do uh, analytics within the context of the four walls. Then the big one on the functional side, um, geospatial cohort builder. So if you've ever used something like I2B2, um, it's basically a way to quickly build a cohort with ha without having to know SQL. Oh. In 2020, this is, this is what we're looking um, at today probably half of it will change, but um, so really the highlights here, we've, we've toyed with our benchmarking strategy and really what does that look like. Um, so we expect by 2020 we've, we will, or sooner, we will have that nailed down. And then contract management, so understanding, um, you know, A, should you be in a value-based contract? And B, if you are, how do you, how do you go about monitoring it? All right. What questions are there? Go, yeah, I'm, I think I'm supposed to run this around, so. Oh. Well, I'm, I may have missed something, but I'm trying to understand what exactly healthy net is, because a uh, healthy intent is, because you're showing a lot of different visuals and stuff, and is it, like an asset that you're bringing to different clients and then customizing it, or how does this? Yeah, good point. Work? I probably yeah. should have clarified that, huh? Um, yeah, nice. So, so healthy intent is a 
quote unquote big data platform. It's a software as a service. We're managing your data as a service. And then we're providing primarily web applications with Tableau embedded um, as a part of that. So it's, you know, think of it as a combination of using technology and software as a service with the actual management of data as a service. Does that make sense? Close enough, okay. Hi, we're from Indiana University Health. Sure. Um, how close are you to having a template that you can roll out? Just, hey, you're interested in healthy intent, here's a prepackaged package of things that most institutions find most useful. Um, you'll see us very close in some areas and not so close in other areas, as you've probably experienced. So uh, the, the content catalog continues to grow. Um, we will be coming out, I don't know if I put it on, on the, the roadmap slide, but we will be coming out with um, content management to make that a lot easier instead of having to have a bunch of hours um, as associated with services. Oh, almost. I had the same question as him. Like we were, I was hoping to see healthy intent. Like how do you work with the Tableau in the Cerner using that platform? So what was the healthy intent? So I wanted to see that, like if, is there any sure. demo or something? Um, yeah, so healthy intent and I can, I did gloss over it. Um, So when we talk about healthy intent, this is really what we're talking about. So we are providing a platform for th where we're gonna ingest all of these different data sources. We're gonna, prov we're gonna manage your data as a service. Um, we're gonna standardize, we're gonna cleanse. We're gonna map that to um, industry agnostic or, or source agnostic models. On top of that, we're doing person matching. So think of EMPI. Um, we're also doing what we would call concept and code mapping um, so that the proprietary codes we actually map back to um, industry standards, SNOMED, LOINC, whatever it may be. As a part of that, we're creating the longitudinal record um, and serving that longitudinal record up via multiple solutions. So healthy record, healthy registries, et cetera. Things that are meant to help providers manage um, manage their patient, patient, uh, pro, patient panels, uh, especially with a chronic condition or wellness type lens. On the analytics side, how we're, how we're embedding, how we're embedding um, Tableau within it. So this is, this is, and I didn't show the full picture here, but this is Tableau embedded within Healthy Intent, within Healthy EDW. So, it's web application, you have a URL, you go sign in, we have a portal. I did not show that clearly here, um, but as a part of that, the links all end up being Tableau or business objects and primarily Tableau. Hi, Jennifer Kofer, uh, VA Medical Centers. Um, you were talking that this is embedded, but is there also a way for us to get to the data from Tableau or another analytical system that we have to do custom reporting? Yes, so as a part of EDW, um, you have, we give you lightweight tools, and I, I know I did not state this, but we give you transformation tools, um, a query tool, a metadata building tool, as well as the ability to connect directly to Tableau to create your own content. Yep, here, here I was clearly um, highlighting some of the content that had already been created, but this is not a, here's, here's a whole bunch of content and that's that. It's a content plus functionality. So I think that, oh, one, one more question. Hello, it is uh, Ben Marie Holmes with uh, Quest Diagnostics. I saw you guys use MapForce for all your normalization of all your different data inputs. 
Altova, yeah. Why did you choose that, and why is it better than all the other products that are out there? <laughs> Good question, and I, and I don't know that it is better at this point <laughs> now. Um, we went, you know, like we do with most things, we went out to RFP and from a price price point and a functionality at the time, and this was in 2012. Um, you know, I, I think it's grown a whole lot. Um, frankly, there's some things that I would like to see Altova do um, that they haven't, but. If you were to pick now, what would you pick? Oh Lord, I'm not going there. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I'm not going there. <laughs> I think Fair. we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, Peter will be up here for qu any questions you have for a couple minutes, maybe? Sure. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Please, please fill out your...